you got it. There it is. <coughs> The uh, United States has a number of resources. We're, we're a very fortunate nation in that we've got plentiful resources that can produce energy. Predominantly, we use petroleum, <coughs> coal, and natural gas. We've got a pretty good segment of nuclear. Nuclear is not growing so much until it, uh, everyone's satisfied it's doing what it needs to do. But this others here, 1%, that's where we're trying to dig in. We're trying to uh, get into the renewable energy segment of that pie. Hydroelectric, obviously a good choice. Petroleum, you're at the mercy of the folks that have it. Those that don't get to pay for it. Coal, we got a lot of it, but we're going away from coal. We're drifting towards natural gas, a little bit cleaner source of fuel. <coughs> we're currently dependent on these fossil fuels, petroleum, coal, and natural gas, for about 86% of our energy. Go ahead, Joe. Unless you want me to do that. Yeah, that's the right in front. Okay. Renewable energy definition, um, and there's many of them, but this is one of them. Any naturally occurring, theoretically inexhaustible source of energy, such as biomass, solar, wind, tidal energy, wave energy, these are only on the coast, of course. Geothermal, only certain locations, and hydroelectric, which can be wherever they can harness a river or a stream. Those are not dependent on fossil fuels. Neither is what we are trying to do with waste energy. Waste energy is very similar to hydroelectric. There's, it's constantly being regenerated. The, the average of American generates about eight pounds of trash per day. The landfill is accepting about 250 to 300 tons per day. So your, your community is producing enough trash and garbage to fuel about 10 megawatts worth of power. And we wish to try to get into that to, uh, what is that doing, Bill? Did I minimize it somehow? Commercial municipal waste energy has been in operation in the United States for about 30 years. There's a, there's a plant up in Spokane, Washington that's been in operation since 1980. It operates in downtown Spokane. They, uh, most of the people that live there or have visited there don't realize that it's there other than that there's trash trucks coming and going all day long. You can operate it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Did we catch something? Most of Okay. Uh, municipal solid waste being full recognition as renewable energy would be EPA back in 2005. They, uh, they have recognized it, however, not all of the states have recognized it at this time. Only 24 states and the District of Columbia recognize waste energy type technology as a renewable source. Iowa is one of them. Uh, where we came from in Colorado is not. We're trying to get that changed with some legislation. We've got a community there that would like to work with us for uh, the very simple reasons. They want to create some jobs. They've got uh, a similar operation with a landfill as you have here, a centralized landfill that serves a larger community. And uh, they've, they've suffered through some plant closings. Pickle plant closed, they lost 150 jobs. A bus plant closed, they lost 250 jobs. And a, a community with an 8,000 population in the, in the largest town is suffering quite a bit. They, they felt the biggest brunt of that uh, roughly 400 jobs that were lost. These are all the, the, uh, the uh, actually the, the government bodies that have recognized waste energy. Converting ordinary waste products into synthesis gas is what we're going to try to do. We, we do that by exposing the trash to extreme heat, somewhere between 1300 and 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. But we do that in an oxygen-starved environment. It's a combustion chamber that is not open to the atmosphere. 
we control the amount of air that's introduced to it so that we get the, uh, the trash to decompose or to combust to a point where it releases its hydrogen, its carbon, its uh, oxygen, and uh, then we can pull that gas off, scrub it, and use it to power a turbine. Gasification has been around a long time. Uh, 1839 is when a gentleman by the name of Bischoff in Europe started the first documented use of it. He started breaking down wood and produced gas with it that he could use for other power. In 1901, a gentleman by the name of T.H. Parker in the United States uh, made a, a wood gas vehicle that was powered by wood gas. There was a device similar to what you see here. This is an old Ford that somebody did back in the 1940s. They uh, put a gasifier on the side of it and used, just push wood and charcoal and coke into it to create the power. They were using this as a tractor. That was before John Deere and IH. I saw an IH cap here someplace yeah. But uh, in 1942, the Nazi Germany uh, armies were afraid they were going to run out of petroleum. They got pretty involved in developing gasification as a form of fuel. And several of their vehicles and uh, war machine was operating on wood gas, specifically wood gas. Today, uh, in 2010, let's go there, uh, the United States had 87 of these waste to energy plants operating. Mostly on the East Coast, uh, the extreme Northwest, a few in Minnesota, and not too many other places. It took a large population where ground was at a premium, where landfills were able to be just put out in an open ground and nobody missed that ground. It didn't seem to bother them too much. In Europe, uh, there's over 400 of them at the same time. These are all larger scale plants. We are not proposing to build a large scale plant. Most of what you see there is those 87 numbers, probably 95% are 100 megawatts or larger. All we want to do is produce 10 megawatts. That's all Alliant Energy has verbally announced that they will work with us, is 10 megawatts. Denmark has, uh, this actually is a waste energy plant. It's built back in uh, 2008. They put a ski slope around it. They are pretty proud of it as an architectural marvel. But that is an actual operating waste and energy plant where they take trash and push out electricity. China has vowed to uh, have at least 30% of the, their electricity received from waste and energy plants by the year 2030. They are moving forward. China can afford to buy just about anything they want. And they're taking technology from other places and putting it to use. These are plants that are being considered. These are not plants that are operating. You'll see pretty much the same areas, the extreme northeast, the uh, parts up there, Washington, Oregon, California is getting into it, Florida is into it very well. I'm sorry, my bar. Okay. Uh, but these are, these are the concentrations that are being seen right now. This map is about, what well, I think, three years old, two years old. There are some considerations in Iowa. You, you may be familiar with one over at Marion. They're trying to build a plasma arc. We are not a plasma arc operation. We propose to build one that's much less involved, less dangerous in fact is what we, we believe also. A plasma arc operation will operate around 3,000 degrees. That's, that's extremely high temperatures, and a plasma arc will destroy everything it touches. It'll turn into ash. We don't want to mess with that. We feel very comfortable with the technology that we're bringing forward. What we want to do, and with your cooperation, if you approve this, is uh, we want to divert the trash from your landfill. We want to try to extend your landfill by asking you not to bury it, but convert it over to our plant, where we'll recover and sort out all the recyclable materials we can find. The tin, the glass, the metals, uh, anything that's non-combustible will come out. 
There will be some item, items that will go back to the landfill, but uh, they'll be non-combustible concrete, rubble, rocks, dirt, that kind of stuff. If we divert that trash, we, we preserve your landfill for an extension of probably five to six times. So if you've got 10 years left, and I know you've got more than that, you'd have 50 to 60 years lifespan left. And by the way, your landfill is very well organized. Uh, my compliments, we have been to several landfills, and this is by far the most organized, well put together operation we have witnessed. From the, uh, the waste that we hope to get from in, we want to produce renewable power. We're going to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels by doing that. We're going to create base load power that's going to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week, or a year, I'm sorry. That's unlike wind and solar. We see a lot of wind around here, and I hope you don't think we're some of that wind, but we, we saw a lot of windmills on the way down from the airport today, and uh, we realized that wind is, is one of those operations that has some great benefits to it, but if the wind's not blowing, the juice is not pumping out. We'd like to also pr produce power from within here so that you would have a local source of power if necessary. That would only mean that the transmission lines are, are down from the big power plants. We expect to create some local employment, full-time jobs, 55 to 60 jobs. We're, we're targeting right now 58. We hope that we get some peripheral employment from that, that other jobs will prop up to support that business that we're bringing. We want to improve the environment, and we feel that we can do that by avoiding the decomposition of buried trash and reduce the, the leachate potential. These are long-term thoughts. Methane is one of those things that we don't see, we don't know what it's doing, but it's growing out there right now in that mountain. You can mine it, you can tap it with a well, and you can use that for electricity as well. And I would encourage you to do that. If you get a company like that that would like to do that, take advantage of it. We are hoping to short circuit that decomposition so none of it goes into the ground and goes straight into electricity. We want to take existing proven state-of-the-art waste management recycling equipment that's out there now. We are not a manufacturer. We are not somebody that has a company that builds these things. We are bringing together several companies that will have the equipment that they use to produce the shredding or the sorting or the gasification or the gas turbines. And we'll try to put those all together in a, in a coordinated effort so that they work together and produce this power. And we want to, what is Just that? to interrupt, in that we have spent roughly two and a half years of engineering and studying how to integrate all those parts, working with each of the vendors, Combustion Associates out of California, uh, the gas fires out of New Mexico. We've worked with all of them to design this system. So there are improvements each of those vendors have made so that the system melts together well. So there's about two and a half years of engineering study on that side. I, we, we have also tried to get our equipment from the United States. We're also discovering that a lot of the companies in the United States are not competing well in this industry. Uh, there was a, a group over Cherokee, Iowa, Lindell. Uh, they have since gotten out of the trash handling business and gone to a special group. He didn't want to discuss any, anything further. But we do think that we can find a lot of our equipment in the United States and get it all put together. The, uh, the power that we generate will compete very well with solar and very well with uh, wind. We can't compete with coal. We can't compete with natural gas. We just are not in that ballgame. They are too, there's too much power and energy in those, those particular sources of fuel. But we can do about 40% better than wind, and about uh, about the same, 35 to 40% better than solar. 
We can provide a community power generating capability that utilizes green energy and augments the community power needs in the event of a commercial power disruption. I, I had this slide in there. Uh, the group that we were working in in Colorado was uh, community in La Junta, Otero County. They had some some backup generators for their city power plant. Uh, like I said, a, a community of about 8,000. They had seven large diesel, engine, diesel engines that ran generators. They power them up once a month just to make sure that they're running, but they're 1930 vintage, and they know they're going to die someday. We felt that we could provide them with some backup power. The units will provide 10 megawatts each. We can daisy chain them together, they'll work in parallel, up to about 100 megawatts. We get beyond 100 megawatts, we got a pretty large footprint and it just isn't efficient. It's 24-7, I mentioned that before. Uh, we, we're capable of eliminating about 240 tons of refuse per day. You're producing somewhere between 250 and 300. You've got some lean months during the winter, we would probably stockpile some of that trash so that we have a, an excess on hand. One ton of municipal solid waste, if, this, if you can read the small print here, is equal to one REC, re Renewable Energy Credit, and that's calculated that it avoids one ton of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. It also avoids some other things. Uh, we, we avoid the production of methane. We avoid the, the carbon dioxide that would be released if you were not recycling materials. You see around the room several displays on, on your recycling program. It's, yours is excellent. That's one of our concerns. Maybe it's too damn good. As part of our business plan demands that we have a revenue stream from recyclable materials. Iowa with its five cent can deposit and bottle deposit takes care of a lot of it. What you folks have been doing on your own is take care of a lot more of it. The average for the United States is 3% coming back in the trash. You folks are below one. That's excellent. Not good for us, but it's good for you. We'll reduce the dependence on fossil fuels. I'll keep harping on that because that's our main thought here. And we meet or exceed the EPA's emission standards. We're self-contained turnkey system. We originally designed this operation to work in military installations where they wanted to avoid taking their trash out into the desert with an armed convoy and burying it or burning it. We were going to try to eliminate their waste on camp in the base site so that they didn't have to get exposed to danger. Here's kind of a block diagram, and it's a little busy. I apologize for that, but this kind of shows you how how this whole process is going to work. If if we can do it here, we'll take or divert the trash from from your landfill. We'll weigh it, keep track of it, send you monthly reports. We'll run it through a, a primary shredder that will take it down to about eight inches. We hope that will take out all the bags because most of the trash coming now is in. A plastic bag of some sort. We can't sort it if we can't see it. So we're going to run it through a shredder, get it to a manual sorting, pull out all the stuff that we can. If that's not good enough, then we'll run a uh, optics optic sorter and try to pull out everything. There'll be a magnets there, of course, to handle any metal that, that comes through the stream. They go through a series of shredding. Once it gets down to that final shred, if we don't need to put any of it in storage, we'll divert it to a briquetter, which will put it into a compression form. Uh, and that's what we'll use for storage of the, of the material. We'd like to keep about a five to seven day supply of fuel on hand in the event of a snowstorm or an interruption of service or something. Uh, and maybe we won't need to do that. We'll also have natural gas hooked up to uh, keep the generators running in the event that we're not able to produce enough sink gas. The, uh, the briquettes will go into storage or they will come back to landfill if we don't need that feedstock for our fuel. The final shredder will take it to a dryer, it'll go into the main key in this whole thing is the gasification system. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. It's not as fancy as you might suspect, but 
it'll uh, it'll reduce the stuff down to its prime elements: hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and then we'll take that process will be at 1300, 1800 degrees. We'll take that heat off of it as much as we can. We'll take that for radiant heat or we'll use it to power a boiler. A power boiler, we, we feel we may be able to use as a byproduct or we can heat our buildings with it for certain. Uh, from that heat recovery chamber, we'll go to a scrubber, take out the dioxins and the nox and the sox, what they call them. Uh, nitrous oxide and sulfur oxide. Those are the bad things that we don't want in the atmosphere. We can scrub them out with technical uh, equipment. It'll go through another finished scrubber, and then we'll compress it. We'll take that gas, which is about, it's got a BTU value, value about 25% of natural gas. So it's not quite strong enough to, to work as natural gas, so we'll compress it into a state where we can put it into a storage tank and we'll keep it there until we need it. We'll pull it out in a compressed state and it'll operate a calibrated gas turbine that's manufactured by an outfit in, uh, in Corona, California called Combustion Associates. I'll show you a picture of that coming up too. It's kind of a slick little operation. It's a self-contained unit. It's got another module with it for a transformer switching and then we'll, we'll move it on down the line to Alliant Energy. They have uh, verbally agreed to work with us to accept up to 10 megawatts. Um, scrap tire. What, what about the scrap tire? Oh, I'm sorry. We, that was, we can handle scrap tires. In fact, we love them. Sorry, there's a lot of them around. Well, you, we hope there's a lot of them around. Yes. Liberty Tire has pretty much gotten a stranglehold on this community. They will take about all of them. In fact, they will take all of them. If you look at the, uh, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, you'll find that they list Liberty Tire as their outlet for scrap tire. We want all we can get. In fact, we, we would even put a truck on the road to go get them. One of those tires has triple the value of trash. The BTU value is tremendous. They, we can have a pile of those that <coughs> one third the pile of, of those 80, 80 tons of tires would run our tire operation for a day. We need 240 to 300 tons of trash to do the same job. So if we can get tires, we're happy as hell. Okay, uh, good question. I didn't mean to roll through this too quickly. If you got questions, what about uh, old seed corn? Old seed corn, we love it. Yeah, it's got a good value. Any biomass type stuff like that, seed corn is very dry. That, that's a good fuel. Uh, in fact, I've got a cousin that uses seed corn as his, uh, in his corn stove. Pretty good heat. Smells okay, too. As long as it didn't have uh, chemicals on it that, that would decompose rapidly. There's basically about 100 items on the not to uh, put into the gas fire list. Uh, PVC pipes are no no uh, because of the hydrocarbons that puts out and then it just makes scrubbing it so much. And in our plasma system, you can put that in there because it breaks it down to its basic elements and separates the carbon hydrogen chains better. Uh, medical waste is a no-no. And in our plasma system, which runs so much hotter, you can do that. So there is a list of items that will not go into the gas fire. I, I, Biomass is great for it. I believe the landfill has a list of taboo items, don't they? Items you will not accept here. Same for us. We don't want that stuff. We certainly don't want it running through the gasification. So those things will be sorted out. The hazmat, the beverage cans, the metal food containers, plastic and glass bottles and jugs, scrap tires. We can take scrap tides if they're out there. I know they are. I saw a pile when we drove up here along the electric line. But we, we anything that's, that's wood byproducts, is even better than trash. In, in, the, in the hierarchy of, of BTUs, trash is way down at the bottom, then you got about 50% higher is wood, and about double that, and triple the value of trash is, uh, is tires. Are there other questions? I really don't mean to skip through this too quickly. Yeah, I got a question about, sure. the, about the ash that's produced. The ash? The ash is a concentration of 
everything that's left over. So it's it's, it's not something you want to roll in. Well, the reason I'm asking it, okay, is I lived in a community before some time ago uh -huh. that had a very sophisticated for its time uh, process of burning the trash and built doing steam and selling the steam. Okay. The heat. And they closed it down because the DNR said there was too much stuff in the in the ash that they wouldn't allow them to bury it. Yeah. And yes, if you're processing all elements in, then your ash really becomes toxic. That's why you have to there are certain elements you will not process in a gasifier to avoid that. Uh, the ash component that we will produce uh, will be able to, to be delivered and buried here at the landfill. Uh, we have also though, looked at other aspects, which is to turn around and maybe sell it to cement plants, to put it into uh, block factories, uh, cement like that. Because once it gets placed in there, it becomes a non heat you can use it. And it actually helps us cement stuff. But we have not talked to anyone here about pop a possible market for the ash. But depending on what you put in can make that ash extremely toxic. That's why you have to stop it from the front side. Yes, sir. Just back up a couple paragraphs. You said that you have a uh, agreement with Hawaiian Energy. Does that mean you have a power purchase agreement signed with them? Not signed. It's a verbal power purchase agreement. Yes. They have a, they have a sign. No, we they met have with uh, Steve, Steve Shoup. Shoup today. Uh, they are doing their feasibility study, which is the build out of their substation and all the aspects that have to go into that substation. They don't foresee any problems in it. And then we will sign a power purchase agreement, which the first amendment on that power purchase agreement is the engineering design for build out of the substation. Now, why couldn't you get the uh, Black Hills uh, Utilities and Tri-State or the World Group and uh, Excel to sign on to a power purchase agreement within Colorado? They, they, because Colorado does not recognize this as renewable energy, and their renewable energy portfolio was satisfied through the year 2015, they said, we don't need it. Well, actually, some of their comments were that it wasn't cost effective with uh, our purchasing off the grid as a green source. They said we were cost effective compared to wind and solar, but not cost effective compared to what they could get from natural gas and coal. Oh, I thought they were talking about their green sources. No. Could no. Consider coal or natural gas. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. We, they were comparing, they were getting their coal for about 2.3 cents per kilowatt. The Kamechi plant that Excel built. <clears throat> in conjunction with IREA, it's a multi-billion dollar plant, and the bonding that they supported, that plant needs to run at roughly about 97% to pay the bond back. And since we're tier two in Colorado, and not tier one, we don't generate renewable energy credits, so we don't count in the renewable energy side. So does the utility board in Colorado have the same philosophy it does in Iowa that if, if you generate energy through through what's called the, the green source, they have to buy from you a certain amount. Now, is that, is that the no. same rules in Colorado? It, it's, you're very close to it, though. Uh, they have to buy from small right. servers. That's why you're staying under 250 tons. Uh, we would be We're classified as a large one because really? we're producing 10 megawatts. Yeah. If, if, they, if you had a windmill in your backyard in Colorado, they would be committed to <laughs> accepting that power and paying you for it. But not if we're producing on a, that would be our business, not just a sideline extra. Earlier in your, uh, right at the beginning, you said that you talked about 87 large gas station plants in the yes. United States. And you said you were not one of those. Now, right. now you just tell me you are a large, 250 tons is a we are small. Not, we are not large in the spec of 100 megawatts. We're You're right, but that's because you have 250 tons. Yeah, we would be a power producer. If you were doing 15,000 or 1,500 tons, you'd be starting to boost your, your, your power. Well, basically, yeah. for every 10 megawatts, you need about 240 tons. Right. So, for example, Waste Management has created a company out of New York that takes all the New York City trash. 
and they're running roughly, I think they're up at about 240 megawatts out of that uh, gas supplier. And it's actually an arc plasma that they're doing. We consider that large, okay? We consider anything, uh, Covanto, uh, Fairfax County, they're doing, we toured their plant, they're doing 78 megawatts. Uh, they're taking roughly over, uh, they're ingesting, I think it's 15,000 15, tons. That is a large plant to us. A 10 megawatt, our, our model is 10 megawatts. We don't consider that large, therefore we refer to ourselves as a small electrical producer. If you're in Colorado and you have fallen through what they define as a small producer, then it's the person who puts solar panels on their roof to generate. Then Black Hills Excel needs to take that power from them. Kil kilowatts. Not They're megawatts. in the kilowatt range. They're not even in the megawatt range. And that was the explanation that uh, Chris Burke with Black Hills gave us as well. Yeah. If, if you're familiar, seem to be familiar with Black Hills. They they are also in this general area, but uh, they. We're aligned for the There you go. They have since expressed renewed interest in those. So we've, we've gone back and we've discussed it with them. Uh, we've also uh, talked with Heidi Morgan with their their uh, Green Energy Group, and, and she has offered to help us get legislation through the state of Colorado. Well, you know, this is exactly what Mr. Pratt said, the Black Hills is well, the most Pratt. It's the most cost-effective ways to resolve renewable energy goals because they're mandated to do re renewable energy goals to stray away from part of their from fossil fuels. It, you know, uh, this particular project was nowhere near where we needed to be on justifying the expenditures on additional power coming from biomass. So you're saying Mr. Pratt has changed his? Uh, no, Mr. Uh, Pratt, I haven't spoken with him since that. He's, he's that really kind of the guy, you know. So well, he's one of the guys that we spoke with. Uh, Chris Burke was the other guy. Uh, we've. We've gotten from them that they are not interested at this time. They don't need us to satisfy their portfolio. The PUC gave them authority to not meet their 2011 portfolio. That standard. was my point. XL, Black Hills, the, tri right. the rural area, and also Arkansas Gas and Light, too. At this time, they're not interested in biomass. But Alliant is Alliant because they have to. They're mandated by the IUB, the Iowa Utility Board, that if someone generates, if I put up a windmill in my backyard, yes. Yes. they have to buy the power from us. That's, that's the rules in the state of Iowa. So is that is that why this works for you? Is that why your Lark's uh, Spur Colorado company has come to Iowa then? Because we have that rule that if you build it, they have to purchase some of it. That, that rule is there too, but it's only on a small scale. Kilowatts. Megawatts are a thousand kilowatts. So, we're, we're talking much bigger than them, but not as large as 100 megawatts. You're at 10 megawatts. We're right. 10. So we're, we're a small fish in this sea, and we, we hope to be a producer. So we, we, we want to be a, a power producer, not just a windmill in my backyard that produces more than I use. And so when this is about a, two weeks old, the reason Black Hills is interested now, and they're working with the state senator and the, and the congressman, to get it switched to tier one, which means they get count renewable energy credits, is they just went in front of the commission, they're asking for a 15% hike for their natural gas plant. So they're asking for that also, and that becomes, as soon as we become tier one, we become useful for them. They have enough power with the current natural gas managing plan to service their needs. Anytime when you look at electrical usage, when the economy gets depressed, the electrical usage drops. When the economy is doing well, the usage goes up. Colorado, with its unemployment rate in that, the usage has dropped, so they don't see a big need. But they also went and got waivers from the PUC because they aren't going to meet them. And the Alamosa stuff that they were going to do, that's fallen by the wayside. So it's a lot of dynamics in Colorado. Originally, we were we were aligned with Arkansas River Power Authority, if that's the one you're referring to. They were willing to work with us. In fact, they helped us get as far as we did with the Otero County project. Uh, then they had a 
a plant over in Lamar, Iowa, that they had converted from natural gas to coal, which is kind of the opposite of what everybody's doing right now. That plant had about $180 million worth of overruns. They got uncomfortable buying 10 megawatts of power from us. And they said, we just think we have better back out. Because our, our, our board is not going to satisfy, be satisfied if we sit here buying power when we've got the capacity to produce power. Well, then how much luck have you had selling your product? How many of these have you built? We have built none. This is going to be the pilot. Hopefully the model. We'll probably have the one in Antarctica. The one in Antarctica will be up for this one. That's kind of a nice way. But that's a one megawatt small system. Yeah. Uh, if you want to know where else, once Black Hills and the representative change, we will build one in La Hunt, Colorado, Otero County. We have the landfill agreement verbally discussed. Uh, they're on board with it. Uh, this weekend, well, actually on Monday, I was with Augusta County Landfill down in Virginia and OPEC. It's very interested in doing that, and we went through that process. And we're looking our goals to have five of them up in about three years. So, and that's why we're pushing for them. Good question, though. Anything else? Why don't you use methane also? If you're going to take the <coughs> Come in stuff, why don't you? We would be in. happy to work with methane. Uh, methane is excellent. It's about the same quality as what we're going to produce. Uh, what we wanted to do was create a model <coughs> that would show people that we can eliminate their trash. This satisfies several markets in this country and abroad. Trash is the bigger problem than methane in third world countries. Uh, we've, we've been approached to consider Cambodia and North Vietnam, both names that I'm not real comfortable with. But they, they dump their trash right now out in, out in a field and they just let it lay there. And pretty soon the, the rains or whatever washes it down into the Mekong del Delta and it disappears into the ocean. And not a real good way to handle your trash. But they've approached us. They would like to develop it, help us, uh, or help them get some power into their backwoods. And if we could do that by eliminating their trash problem and their sewage problem at the same time, they're interested. We think we can do sewage. We're not real thrilled about the thought. Sewage actually has a pretty fair BTU value. But you got to dry it. It takes a lot of parasitic heat to get it to a point where you can actually combusted, uh, so it's, it's not something we want to work with yeah. in the first place. It's basically a lot. That, that leads to another question. Mm -hmm. Well, why, why aren't you fellas going somewhere where their back is against the wall with their uh, municipal waste product? We're not. We've got a great thing out here. We've got decades and decades of room, and it's been managed that way, and we have other options also. Plus, nobody knows what the future holds in this technology. Oh, just as gasification has been around for 50 years, seriously, the, the, that's going to change too in the next decades. And quite frankly, I'm sure that's why you're in the business. This, this is a huge... It's an opportunity. It's a big opportunity. Yeah. You're right. So I'm wondering why you're not giving a presentation before uh, municipalities or, uh, or uh, 2080 agreement uh, groups that have their back against the wall with their landfill problems. We're not one of them at all. Actually, this could have the reverse impact. We have no problems out here at all. We have a great relationship with our DNR, which is very hard to uh, get with any state and any landfill. True. We have an excellent with them. Now, now if we go out and, and support your $35 million plant out here, we I don't know what the liability will be for us. We're certainly going to be a partner along with Alliant. And and uh, and you guys, we're, we're, you're using our resources. You're gasification is uh, taking it there and you're selling it five six cents to uh, align energy so partners so I just wondered why you should be out here well, I just wondered why you how you picked us out but we, we, we don't really have an issue here's what I did I contacted of those 24 states that recognize green energy waste energy as one I contacted their economic development boards 
I wanted to go to Hawaii. They've got captive trash. They're currently wrapping it in three layers of plastic, putting it on a boat, shipping it to Washington, trucking it to Idaho, and burying it. I thought we could provide a pretty good service for them. I still do. What happened? They have no interest. Why is that? Because they don't need it. They, they have enough money in their pocket. It's not a big deal to them. you, you got to understand, when you look at the trash industry, you have waste management who has a large hold on the trash industry. We understand that here. And waste management makes an awful lot of money burying the trash. They do it very well. They charge a lot. And they make a lot of money. So unless they're energized to open up, not bearing trash is not something in their business model. So when we started doing the criteria, it's county-owned landfills that are not tied into long-term contracts with waste management. It's power companies that are willing to take renewable energy power and have a need for it or are forced to do that. And it's an economic development community that wants to bring in people and create jobs. So unless we have all three of those, it's not really a feasible thing. In Kauai right now, and what's going on down there, waste management has that stranglehold. They don't want to give that up. So they don't own the trash. It's their landfill. The waste management has a long-term agreement. If you look at Fairfax County in Virginia, they receive over 140,000 tons of trash. There are about 1.2 million, million tons of trash. They are in a long-term agreement with waste management. That agreement runs for 15 years. So even though it would be a good thing to do, they aren't going to do it because waste management has that agreement. So North Iowa Landfill provides a good opportunity because there isn't that long-term contractual agreement with waste management one of the big haulers, it has the ability to, to take and create jobs in, in, from the economic development standpoint, and it has an electric company willing to accept the power. So that's one of the, when we ran through the criteria and we contacted Frank, that's why you guys popped up. We're going to go back to La Junta once they fix the tier from tier two to tier one, because they have all those criteria. And Black Hills is working with us to do that. So it all you need all three of them to get a viable solution because it's a symbiotic partnership. Quite truthfully, the, the power company is the biggest hurdle. Alliant Energy being willing to work with us uh, has been a big draw for us. That helped us decide where we're going to focus. Here's where we came. If you feel it's more beneficial to bury the trash, by all means, we're not going to try to disrupt that. We, we are trying to bring something forward that will create some jobs. We can sell the power to align energy. And you've got a single point that we have to divert from. You serve 29 communities, I believe. Is that right, Bill? Yes, 27. 27 communities. Two, two counts. It's all coming to one spot. If, if we work with smaller outfits that weren't producing as much trash, then, then our business model doesn't work either. We gotta have at least 250 to 300 tons per day coming through. Hey, That's how we got it. Yeah. How much of that do you stockpile? Like you said, you're gonna stockpile some before. We'll, we'll stockpile probably, if, I'd, I'd like to have several hundred tons on hand. And where, I, where, where would you put that? I would, I'm, I'd like to put it in a harvest store, put it in a vertical silo. Uh, we've, we've currently got designed into our plan flat storage. I'm okay with that, but when you start thinking five, five days worth of extra feedstock, that's 750 tons, uh, that's, that's a pretty good pile. If I can compress it into briquettes, put it in a, a silo or flat storage and keep some air on it, I think I can handle it. If you, in a couple of slides, you'll see our site plan. And the whole facility is indoors. There's nothing outdoors. So the trucks drive indoors, dump indoors, we process and sort indoors, we gasify and sort, 
and we store any of the waste stream for backup in case there's uh, snowstorms or something, or on weekend Sundays, no trash run. We store it indoors and then we just use it there. So that's where tires should come in real good. Yeah. So they store easy and they got a lot of heat to use. So, yeah, blowing of trash and all that, since it's all indoors, that's why we're doing it. We're also concreting everywhere where trash will be, so it eliminates any leaching into the soil and does have protection. Good question. Yes? Just a simple clarification. 250 to 300 tons a day, is that your starting waste stream or the waste stream that you would send through the gasification? That's what your system? That's the starting waste stream. We're going to sort from that. We expect to get about 87% of that as feedstock. So roughly 200 something per day. We, we feel that we, we're going to produce synthesis gas a little better than than the average, just because of the uh, technology that we're, we're investigating. The, the outfits in California claim they have an outfit that will produce at a higher percentage efficiency than, than others. And if that's true, then we won't have to supplement with anything else. Otherwise, we're going to need more trash. And I, we're in the ballpark, because you, you do, through most, uh, about, Eight to nine months, you're producing roughly 290 to 300. So you're producing excess at this landfill right now. Uh, you got some lean months, uh, November, December, January, February, but uh, they still are producing at 240, 250. These are numbers that I got from your last year's production company. Good questions again. Any more? Well, I guess we did go back. Okay. 12 percent, there's that 87 percent I spoke of. This is kind of a, an artist's depiction of how we intend to sort it. There'll be sorting stations. We won't dump the trucks directly onto the conveyor belt. We would dump it on a platform roughly the size of this room. Uh, if there's something hidden in there that we don't want, that'll get pushed aside immediately, like a refrigerator or something like that comes out of the back of the truck. But we will take what is combustible, put it on the belt, shred it so that we can open up the bags. Then there will be a six-man sorting station uh, with some mechanical assists like air and magnets that will pull out the recyclable materials so that they get put into bins down below. Those bins will be collected, baled, and, and sold as recycled material. This is a picture of a gasification unit, the one that we've been focused on currently. It's manufactured by an outfit in California. It's, uh, it's got a lot of parts on it, but it's a fairly simple process. The, the trash comes in one side and gas comes out the other side. It has several tubes and pipes there that, that allow the gas to go and, and be collected and, and sorted out as necessary. The gas or the trash itself will be self-generating on the heat. So as the system gets started, we'll have to start it with natural gas to get the heat up. But once we get it up to 13, 1500 degrees, then the system will sustain itself with its own combustion. <laughs> this is the turbine generator set. It's a five skid unit. Uh, they come self-contained. This one here is the, the turbine sticking out of that, the end there. They are all in insulated cabinets. You can stand within 10 feet of that unit and be able to hold a conversation. And that's a jet engine. So it, it winds, but it, uh, it's been well insulated. It's in a, a separate containerized unit. So you'll see five semi-trucks worth of equipment come, and that'll be one unit. There's a lubrication skid, there's scrubbers, there's uh, transformers, and there's switches involved there as well. These systems are in operation in third world countries, again. They're, none of them are in operation in the United States. They are produced and they're manufactured in Corona, California. Uh, there's a, a larger 80 megawatt unit assembled in Benin, Africa. There's another one in Belize. They've, uh, they've sent 
units to other smaller communities in uh, in Africa. They all work with natural gas. Is, yes. Does your does your parent company own that company in Roma? No, we do not. No. Our parent company is is a defense contractor. Uh, we have no other than a good relationship with these people. We have no no other ties. Any other questions? The, uh, I tried to list what I thought were some of the pros and cons about any participation from landfill to North Island. I, I think there's some, some important ones that probably aren't on this list, but if you think of some, let's discuss them now. Some that I thought of, uh, the, the main one being landfill life extension. You're not up against the wall. So you can go for many, several years yet before that's a problem. We can help you extend the life of your equipment. You bought a new Caterpillar dozer, I assume. Was it Caterpillar? Oh, yeah. Uh You could extend the life of that because it's not going to be needed quite as strongly as it was. Uh, there could be a labor budget reduction. I'll try to outline that further on in this presentation. Uh, we, we think that maybe this would give you the ability to expand your operation if you felt you could. The recycling commitment that you've already made will be only enhanced. And right now there are some things still getting into the, into the ground. We would pull out 100%. The, uh, the green energy commitment would give you a, I don't know, sort of feel good type of attitude that, yeah, you're producing something with your trash rather than burying it. <laughs> There would be reduced methane gas potential. In other words, the trash that we divert from being buried will not decompose into methane 10 years from now. We think that uh, what we are doing will support the community, uh, providing the jobs. We think that uh, you're already doing a good job of educating. This will only enhance that operation as well. Public opinion, not real sure where that's going to go. I kind of listed that on both sides. That, that public opinion might be wholeheartedly behind this. It could be wholeheartedly against it as well. We accept that. There will be a reduced pollution potential, the leachate, the uh, runoff water, because all the trash will not be in the ground. It will be turned into electricity. Reduced IDNR payment. This is the one that I think you benefit the most from. I'm not sure what your payment was last year. But uh, the, rough, roughly a buck fifty to three bucks, I think, is where we're at per ton. Is what you're paying Iowa Department of Natural Resources now. That will reduce by maybe eighty percent, maybe more. DNR charges you a base, uh, and then they charge you extra per tonnage. And I'm talking to DNR. I'm not sure what that base dollar. Talking with Alex Moon, he thought we might be able to reduce your payment to them by about 40%. And it's, it's hundreds of thousands, I think, is what you're paying him now. Last year was around 370000 oh, 370000 Let's don't kid ourselves. That'll last one year. The legislators will tap into that, too. <laughs> you know, that'll change in, in maybe. 18 months. There's no maybe about it. Everybody's looking for the cash. They're not gonna. They're not Your gonna crystal ball is about as good as mine. Maybe well, we know our politicians, don't we? I, I know politicians. I, I, for right now, this is what we're seeing. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to present some things that we think are there. The realization of a, a mandated IDNR goal. I believe they're going to put some tougher restrictions on you. Our politicians, again, will put some tougher restrictions on how much you bury, how much recycle can go in the ground. What, what type of operation you run. You run a very clean operation now. They brag about you guys. They think you're wonderful. And I, I got to agree, I haven't seen any problems here yet either. On the other side of the board, there's a number of things. We are at, asking for up to $5 a ton tip fee. That helps us with our business plan. Uh, and, okay. Yeah, and in relation to that, if you look at it, and we, this would have to come from you guys. We did a quick snapshot based on last year's annual report. Assuming uh, landfill cover would be reduced because you're not bearing as much trash, the reduction in the DNR, that comes down to about a net of 
between $2.40, $2.50, but that's an independent thing that the board actually would need control. But there is an offset on that to be from the other side. And the reason we're asking for that is one of our models, part of that financial model we do is to recycle. And you do such a good job on recycling, 3% that is in the normal trash stream is really 1% or actually a little bit less. So there is a reduction in that. That tip fee sharing, we would want to turn around and after we pay back our loan uh, and our money, that would go away and we would give it back. <coughs> so if you look in, we look at it as a 20, 30 year partnership and running this uh, factory because our goal is not to build it and sell it and go away, but to build it, keep it, and make it part of the community. After we pay back our uh, $35 million, $3.2 million a year loan payment, this goes away. So we would want that in any of the agreements. And here you see the next item is public perception and opinion. It's on both sides. If we're diverting all the commercial haulers over to a site elsewhere than here, the public's going to wonder, what's Bill doing with all those people he's got? So there'll be some, some confusion in that regard. We don't want anybody to go home. We don't want to make somebody lose their job because we came to town. Our desire is to create jobs, wholeheartedly create jobs, not destroy them. And you will see in the Later on, the agreement draft that we've uh, put together, and later on in these slides, our solution for addressing that. Because there would be a reduced workload at at the L and I site, our site, we we were hoping to possibly get a scale operator, get a, a machine operator, an end loader operator, to work with us on certain days or maybe every day. I don't know how we could work it out just yet. But we would pay half of their salary, maybe 30000 30, a year is what we committed to it on our paper. We'll, we'll discuss that more in detail as we go forward. Uh, there'll be a change in routine. People don't like change. Because we will be handling the trash differently. Trash will come into a, a site that's, that's maybe not here. And, and they've got to go down the road a few miles to, to unload it at a, a different building. That's going to upset their routine. Can I see a hand go up? Okay. Uh, there'll be a learning curve, confusion, there'll be additional traffic. Our primary site at this time is over on 43rd Street Southwest, right adjacent to Golden Gray Energy. Now I'll explain that selection process on a couple slides forward here yet. But uh, that's where we anticipate right now. We've, we've talked to the landowner. Uh, we've got an option to buy if we can get all the agreements in place and things go forward. We, we're going to need all of those agreements before we move anywhere. There'll be some reduced methane gas potential. By that I mean you won't be producing more methane gas. So if you were to tap into a well out here and want to use that methane gas to produce electricity on your own at some time, your stream has been cut off. It stopped, you're not burying trash anymore, so that methane production that's going to happen is already in the ground. There'll be bias benefits to the LNI members. Uh, if we locate at 43rd Street Southwest, Mason City's going to feel like they got it in their backyard. Clear Lake, not too far away. The rest of the communities are going to say, well, what's in it for us? Very good question. Um, Maybe someone from your community will be one of those 58 people hired. I don't know. We do want to hire local. There'll be some potential loss of trash value. In the event that 10 years from now or five years from now, somebody comes up to you and says, we want to buy your trash. We'll pay you $10 a ton or $20 a ton for your trash. Then, yeah, you're hooked up with us for 10 years already that wouldn't be a good thing. If you think that's going to happen, you don't want to sign up with us. We need a long-term commitment to satisfy our vendors. Ten years is the minimum. There's some negative impact on the staff over time. 
They said, we don't want to have anybody go home because we came to town. If, if there's some long-term job attrition, we'll have to discuss that and find a way to get it to work. But we do want to get some dedicated people to work as recyclers. And we, if somebody retires, maybe we don't replace them. I don't know. But those are all negotiations and stuff that I think we got to talk about. Are there other pros and cons that you people see at this moment that you'd like to bring forward at this time? What do you look at for a turnover rate as far as employees? We, we think we're going to pay competitive, but maybe not as good as what they can get in Mason City. The average uh, sort is going to be around, what, 27, 30? And we have on the financial slides what the white collar, blue collar, and the position. We took the, in our financial model, we took the, rent was kind enough to provide us the economic data, and we rolled those salaries in. Uh, in our economic model, we, uh, it's full-time salary employee, we pay health care, medical, dental, vision, all that. We have uh, a bonus plan, a uh, pension plan, in for all employees, trying to retain the employees. Um, as someone who, I own the defense contracting company, it's hard as all heck when you lose an employee because you're losing not only the employee and spend that time out of yours, but then you also have to train them and get them up to speed. So on the defense side, we average about 4% attrition. Uh, on this, we want to keep to that same model. In all honesty, I expect that where we'll lose people <coughs> is on the trash sorting side. The mechanical engineers, the electrical engineers, we want to really keep them and lock them down. But we'll, we'll lose on the trash sorting side. We, we also realize that Bill's good that work for and he's retained his staff pretty pretty solid. I don't think you have much turnover at all. Yeah. I don't know we can match that. Because you're working in a closed environment, I don't know how well that's going to yes. be attractive. I, I guess this is almost as much for Bill, but if the landfill isn't handling as much trash, the size of the equipment needed and that type of thing. Can we justify the type of equipment that we have now if we're not handling the trash and if we need to replace it? Is there smaller equipment available? Or are we going to have to buy something that is of a size that we can't justify because we're not handling the trash? There's smaller size equipment that we'd be able to benefit from. There is. Okay. But, but the other side of that is the equipment we have now, we pay attention to where we are in hours. So if they're not being used as hard, they're going to be used longer, potentially. Okay. But there would be an opportunity to, to go smaller equipment if that was, in fact, necessary. And one of the things you're going to see on the other slide is, and in the agreement we even put it, we would like to get the scale operator, uh, one of those people who is trained hazmat, have them come over, open a subcontract with Al Anon to turn around and use his people at our facility so that Bill has that oversight. Because we, one is we don't want to be involved in any of your invoice and accounting practices. Uh, so using your scale operators, your bookkeepers, takes us out of that. Second is we don't want to eliminate jobs. So, you know, if an agreement was reached, basically a couple of those people would actually just change their work location. We don't want them as employees because there's a whole retirement system that they've been working for and we don't want to touch that. So, you know, that's the other point. Of it. We would probably pay you to subcontract them for three days, four days a week, maybe. I don't know. It would have to be something we can work out. But I, I would anticipate, in addition to the scale operator and the hazmat supervisor, that, that we would need an end loader operator and a crane operator on two shifts. We want to run this 16 hours a day, two shifts. We'll be open 24 hours a day, but the, the actual trash processing we don't see a need to run three shifts and have people working those wee hours in the morning. I hated those days. 
I think most everybody here that's been exposed to that would hate it as well. So your what you filled out for a conditional use permit then you you put in there that you're going to run uh, seven days a week, 24 hours. That is correct. Uh, to 100, 120 truckloads a day. Yes, sir. So, but you're telling me now you're not going to do that then. You're only going to do no, that. we will be open. No, no, no. Just, you, in, your, in your additional use permit, you say you run, <coughs> operate, seven That's days right. a week, 24 hours. So, yeah. well, well, if you're only going to work two shifts, you're not going to be able to push trash into the, under the compare no, no. room. We're, the we're trucks gonna, will be let coming. Me, let me ask. Okay. We're, we're going to process on two shifts. We're going to operate 24 by 7. Are you saying you're making briquettes the whole to use on those days where you don't have... We're going to be making enough synthesis gas that we can push into our tank and use it out of the tank as a supply <coughs> system. So the generator's going to run 24 7. The operators on the generator equipment, the gasification equipment, are going to run 24 7. The sorters, the people that are receiving trash. We don't anticipate a trash truck to come in at 1 a.m. Probably not going to happen. So we don't need to have people there standing by on a scale. So we'll try to be efficient. If the need is there and we need them three shifts a day, you bet. Here we go. We'll do that. We, we want to try to run this as a business, not as a service. Well, back up. You said 27 to $30. What, did, what, what, what were you explaining that when you were saying that? He said you talked to Brent Trout. Oh, uh, 27,000 to 30,000. Oh, what's the average salary? Not 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, the unemployment rate up here is not that high. Well, they're off, they're off the record. Now. They're probably so. They're not, they're not showing anymore. Anything else? I'll move the slide. LNICS agreement. This is kind of a, the basics. I brought the, the rough draft along for you folks tonight if you wish to read it in, in paper form. But just the basics of it. We intend to have a, a, a contingent agreement on permitting from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. If we can't get a permit, this is